Last week I read half of Whole Cake Island for reference I ended right here because I had to stop and talk about this after seeing Sanji utterly break down because he was forced to take down Luffy. Seeing Luffy holding out for him to come back and seeing Nami give the most painful slap of disbelief that I have ever seen, it was too much! I had to stop there! But now, I am back, and I made a lot of predictions for this other half, and oh boy, I did, did a lot of them not turn out well. For example, we had so much potential with Sanji's cuffs. We could have stolen the key from Big Mom, especially because we were already in her room. So to see that the handcuffs were fake has to be some of the worst payoff to this problem. I can excuse it with Law, because he literally has the ability to swap things. But here, I can think of like a million different ways to solve this problem. That's it. That is my one gripe before we begin. Because I actually thought Whole Cake Island was good. I think in part, this has some of the best pacing and the climax of any saga. I understand the structure of a normal saga, but I'm not really the biggest fan of an arc focused around finding and destroying the big bad of that arc. But in this climax, we had to just go in, get Sanji, and get out. We were very much avoiding fighting, and so not only did we have to go through a bunch of different environments to locate our guy, but pacing-wise, it allows the premise of the story to change. The story shifts over from a stealth mission to a fight mission to a team-up to an all-out brawl to a chase sequence? Which made this an extremely unpredictable and refreshing saga. Even when we do end up fighting, it never feels like that was the intention. It was just an unavoidable consequence, which is the opposite of something like Alabasta or Thriller Bark. A lot of the joy simply came from the fact that we have so many unpredictable pawns in this arc. We have Sanji's sister, Bez, Chiffon, and later Pudding, who in every chapter introduced a new path that the arc could go in. Whole Cake Island appears to begin as a simple story around Sanji being forced to marry Pudding because of Big Mom. And so, in the first part, I emphasized a lot of Big Mom and Sanji. Big Mom planning uh, literally everything, and Sanji having to follow orders in order to keep everyone alive. And it is only after Sanji defeats Luffy where this premise just entirely changes. The big twist for this arc is Big Mom's trade offer. If Sanji stays for the wedding, then Big Mom won't kill anyone. The twist being that she'll kill everyone. Which honestly, I thought it could go either way. I think Big Mom is selfish enough to not care about this deal, but I think that she could also be too prideful of herself to the point where she could have gone through with this deal. The second plot twist was Pudding completely backstabbing the Straw Hats and Sanji. Again, I did not think this would happen. I've doubted a few characters, but Luffy's always had the intuition to guess a character right. And so when he said Pudding's alright, I thought, yeah, pudding, Pudding's alright. We wouldn't backstab, it's too obvious. Nope, I got backstabbed. I want to talk about this scene for a second where Sanji learns that he got backstabbed though, because it is wonderfully illustrated. Sanji starts off by telling Pudding that she is her one shining light in all of this darkness. That is emphasized by the cloudy atmosphere with the one beam of light, and as the scene progresses it gets darker and darker and rainier as we transition over into this heavy rain as soon as we learn that Pudding is gonna backstab Sanji, and then BAM! Now it's all dark and gloomy, there is no light to be found! Sanji's ray of sunshine is gone both metaphorically and literally. This man is not getting a lot of W's. It was utterly soul crushing to not even be able to get a glimpse of Sanji's face during this entire scene. You can tell that he was utterly heartbroken. Anytime that we actually saw him break down hurt, but here it wasn't even sobbing pain anymore. At this point, he had just gone numb to it all. That's rough, buddy. But you know what? At least in this moment, in a chess metaphor, I think he actually got a good play in. He at least knows that Jerma is done for, he knows that Pudding doesn't care about him, he knows that the cuffs are fake, and he has a lot more viable options for escaping. So he could easily leave if he wanted to. At least if it wasn't for Sanji's chivalry. 
See, Whole Cake Island plants a lot of seeds, right? For example, we have young Sanji cooking for his mother, which is then paralleled by current Sanji cooking for the Straw Hats. I thought this scene with his mom was honestly trying to milk my emotions, but being paralleled to Luffy turned that around for me and made this scene hit so much harder. It is such a beautiful moment to see the contrast between Sanji's guilt and Luffy's blissful acceptance. Even after Luffy plainly accepts Sanji back without hesitation, it's ultimately Sanji who still chooses not to move forward. He wants to save Jerma. He wants to save the Barity, which of course takes us to the plan. I love this. I mentioned that a big plus of this arc was seeing changing goals and dramatically shifting from a stealth mission over into an assassination mission with a goal of teaming up with Beesh to destroy Big Mom is exactly what I meant. Which brings us to outfits. That's right, I'm bringing it back. It's time to talk about outfits because Whole Cake Island has multiple outfit swaps. Every outfit fits the theme of the gold during that section of the arc and it makes it feel so refreshing. It is, to me, probably the best demonstration of outfits in any arc so far. The Straw Hats teaming up with Beige to take the Unbig Mom and then the process changing outfits add so much atmosphere to both the wedding, as everyone is now in fancy outfits, and also matches the Mafia theme that comes with a negotiation scene with Beige and the Straw Hats. So let's talk about Beige. Beige? Someone's gonna, I, uh, no matter how I say it, I know I messed up already. All right, so let's talk about Beige, right? He's a character that I've had my worries about. If anything, I thought he would have been the bad guy ever since the introduction of him back in Dress Rosa, with him seemingly making everything about business and having that mafia vibe. The reason why I didn't think he was a bad guy, though, is because I don't think anyone would ever head into the new world with the intention of being an underling. That has never been a thing that any character has done so far, and it kind of goes against the premise of the new world. So from the beginning, I was thinking that there has to be more to Beige. And luckily, there, there was! I was thinking that he was trying to get close enough to take the Poneglyph. I was not expecting him to try to take out Big Mom, let alone be like a loyal, respectable person who cares about his wife and kids. Seriously, I was not expecting this dynamic to work as well as it did. And just everything about Beige and Chiffon, just everything about this pairing should not work. But it works so well. And I think Chiffon and even the baby do a lot of heavy lifting for Beige. We see how Beige actually prioritizes the Mafia men as well as his wife and kids. We have Shifun also being her own character. I love that she's not simply a background character because family plays a pretty big role in this arc. And it's interesting to see the contrast between Big Mom and the Vinsmokes, who I talked about in the first part, as characters who heavily contradict themselves by objectifying their families. Which kind of makes it seem like any blood-related family is a bad thing. But then we have Beige and Shifon, who are characters who completely oppose this idea. Shifon has a lot of strong moments. She's the character who put herself in harm's way in order to stop Big Mom's rampage. Beige was so proud of her. And I think Shifon's connection to both the Straw Hats and Beige helped ease the negotiations into agreeing to take down Big Mom. Really, <laughs> really unexpected. In every arc, I always wonder what role characters play in their respective arcs. Like, sure, not every character needs to have a specific role and have a specific purpose for the story to work, but it certainly feels better if we can include characters with purpose. In this arc, we had Big Mom, an Emperor of the Sea who has the ability to control people's souls, and it's only appropriate that Brook, the Soul King, would be the one to infiltrate Big Mom's army. And I'm so glad we actually utilized him. Like, Brooke hasn't had a lot of time in the spotlight since his introduction. So this, this right here, was kind of a big moment. I'm just saying, Brooke has some of the best moments in this arc, from the powerful Soul King moment to the, to the dumbest of dumb moments of him breaking the Mother Caramel's picture uh, <laughs> with, with a little Luffy face mask over himself. All right, so the wedding. The wedding is masked around it being a very innocent, happy wedding, but in reality, it's introducing a lot of backstabbery on everyone's end. 
Big Mom's allies have their own plans. Big Mom and Pudding have their assassination plan. Beej and Luffy have another assassination plan. And it's anyone's game, really. There are so many interesting plays going on in this arc. And at the center of everything is Pudding, who is one of the characters that moved a lot of gears. Like, I was not expecting her to backstab anyone. And then guess what? Bam! She's a bad guy. But... I want to talk about Pudding because she's not just a simple haha you thought I was good I'm actually bad type of character. There is complexity to her. When we look into her relationship with Big Mom at first we kind of get the idea that Pudding is equally evil and that's why Big Mom trusts her so much. As the story progresses though we get to see Big Mom's lack of empathy towards every child only valuing certain children by objectifying them all. Pudding is only valuable to Big Mom because she is able to force Pudding to follow orders and see some kind of potential in awakening her third eye. Meanwhile, Pudding is very self-conscious about this anomaly, something that a lot of other children that Big Mom has also struggle with, weirdly enough. And Pudding is so conscious about it that whenever anyone gives her any contradictory information, she cannot comprehend it. Again, very similar to another one of Big Mom's children. Interesting parallel there. And for the wedding, everything went wrong. Pudding couldn't kill Sanji. Nobody could kill the Vin Smokes. Seriously, no one killed the Vin Smokes. Everyone took so long that Sanji managed to get in the middle of it, stop him from dying. And we managed to get a weird Power Rangers looking gear up sequence, which is so cheesy and I do love it. But we, we didn't kill anyone. Not even, not even Beige was able to kill Big Mom. It was a mess. But I really love the assassination plan for Big Mom because the requirements for it to work, as well as the reasons why it works, makes Big Mom a very unique character in One Piece. We could have just had another competent, powerful, smart bad guy that would have been more like Kaido, I guess. But Big Mom is an extremely interesting emperor. She acts more like a stubborn, powerful child. And for that, I think Big Mom carries this arc. The island and the wedding cake both represent what Big Mom longs for, which connects it to the orphanage. So back at the orphanage, in the flashback, in Elbath, which I'm so glad we got to see, so casually too. As a child, Big Mom was a menace. Not only was she absolutely destroying Elbath, but she was also being manipulated by Carmel. Carmel's not the most ethical person, but she at least taught Big Mom to treat everyone equally. And somehow Big Mom distorts that to mean collecting every single race and trapping them in her kingdom. Big Mom kills and absorbs people's souls because she refuses to let anyone leave her again. Like the disappearance that occurred on her birthday. Which... <laughs> which wow like the the fact that she soon discovered that she had Carmel's ability and how the shot is set up leads me to believe that she just consumed everyone and the inability to understand that concept or bury that idea so deep is what makes the wedding cake even more twisted literally everything big mom does is a distorted way of seeing the world for her, the wedding cake is an attempt to recreate her birthday with the hopes of opening her eyes and discovering that no one has left her. Alright, moving on. So a smart thing that I think Whole Cake Island did was simply focusing on a few characters. Because while there are a lot of characters in Whole Cake Island, let's be honest, not a lot of them mattered. Did I like Senshi and Tree having to run away from Big Mom so that he could marry his Triance? Yeah, I did. Was it necessary? D who cares? Uh, even a lot of the secondary characters like Smoothie or Flampe only really exist to feel the primary characters. Whole Cake Island focuses on these handful of characters, and I think it did it for the better. I think it's also better for turning Big Mom into a sentient set piece that we are running away from, while making Katakuri be the actual antagonist of the arc. He is practically as strong as a warlord, who has been uh, the only opponent that we've been trying to defeat in previous arcs. And here we learn that, oh, actually, that's just the underling. That is practically a henchman. 
Whole Cake Island is really just trying to show us what we're in for in Wano, showcasing the strength of an emperor in the proper territory, as opposed to someone like Whitebeard, who is still peak, who purposefully left his territory and fought on the world government's terrain. Katakuri is extremely competent during the wedding, probably the only person who saw it and was capable of dealing with Bija's plan. And this was one of those moments where we were able to use observation hockey. As for the fight with Katakuri, Katakuri versus Luffy, uh, it was serviceable. They're fine. But ever since the introduction of hockey, I've wondered how much will this actually matter? From a strategic fighting standpoint, hockey adds a bit more complexity, especially with observation hockey. But One Piece fights have never really been about strategy uh, compared to other media. I think what hockey does, especially observation hockey, is push the themes of the story very well. Katakuri vs. Luffy is a fight between two strong opponents who think they have the ability to change fate. And Bij highlights this very well when he states that Katakuri might have the ability to see the future, but everyone has an equal right to change it. So while I've mostly covered Luffy and Sanji and Bij, I really want to give credit to Nami for a lot of this arc. She played an important role as a navigator, making sure to tell Luffy that, hey, we're not here for a fight, we're here to get Sanji and get out. She's coming up with all sorts of strategies trying to escape Big Mom. She's the one who creates the thunderclouds, which are enough to temporarily stun Big Mom enough to try to get away. And she fulfills that role great. The other important role for this arc was Pedro. We've been foreshadowing Pedro's death since the start of Whole Cake Island, maybe even since Zoe. During Whole Cake Island, he's having a 1v1 against Bird Guy. I don't remember his name. Bird Guy. It's when a lot of this foreshadowing happens. It's where we learn about this deep connection between both of these characters. One of Big Mom's major motifs has been life or death. We have seen it through the altars where the shadows pull people's souls out. It was something that was emphasized by Jimbei and shown with Pedro. Not only does Big Mom take body parts like an arm or an eye in Pedro's case, but also life of the individual or maybe lives of the entire crew. This section just fills a lot of the gaps surrounding Pedro, Bird Guy, Peckham's, Beppo, and Zoe as a whole. And while I was worried Oda wouldn't actually pull the trigger, because it's happened before, I'm so glad that Pedro died. Because what Pedro's death showcases is the sheer intensity that comes from challenging an emperor. It instantly elevated the stakes by showing that this wasn't a joke. One of the reasons why Pedro decided to do this, besides his shortening lifespan, was because of the dawn. We had to talk about it. Throughout a bunch of these arcs, there has been a running theme presented via subtext throughout all of the Grand Line. But in the New World, it has just become plain text. There are so many instances where people are literally saying that someone out there is going to reveal what's been hiding in the darkness, that we are all waiting for someone to bring the dawn, and everyone is seemingly placing their bets on Luffy, Pedro included. Weirdly enough though, besides maybe Thriller Bark, if you want to count that, there's not a lot of strong visuals that emphasize the sky, the dawn, the sun, the moon, and any of it at all. And I mention this because in Zo we had been hyping up the full moon, but I realized that we don't have any point of reference for the moon. What is the moon's current cycle? Who knows? Is there even a moon in the sky right now? Who knows? We don't really know much about the sky at any given panel. And I mention all of this because Karen's transformation relies on the moon. So it was just funny to hear her talk about the moon. Every time she brought it up, all I could think was, Wow, Carrot, you sure been talking about the moon a lot. I sure do wonder if we'll see a full moon in a page or two. Who would have guessed? Anyways, the full moon essentially lets Minx go full werewolf and increase their power by double. It's, it's cool. I don't have much to say about the scenes that transpired, but what I do wonder though is what it sets up for Wano given how Kaido and his furry army are now up against the fight against Minx who are the, the better furry army. 
All right, let's talk about the cake sequence. I stated this at the beginning that one of the reasons why I enjoyed Whole Cake Island was that its appeal came from it being a non-fighting arc. Whole Cake Island gave us a chance to dive into Sanji's competence with cooking, and it only makes sense in an arc focused around the importance of food that Sanji would play a major role in stopping Big Mom. It almost feels like everything surrounding this arc, from Big Mom as a character to the environment to Sanji as a character, just everything was designed for Sanji, including the escape sequence. After the wedding, putting shifts over into this confused mixed character sequence where she is unpredictable and you don't know how she's gonna act. But at the very least, you do know how Sanji's gonna act, and so you can kinda trust him instead. So there's a lot of cute moments where Sanji is designing a cake and both Chiffon and Pudding are looking at Sanji in a very confused state where he is just absolutely enjoying the process when they think he really shouldn't be. But I think it brings one of the most charming perspectives to Sanji. We have toned down the sib qualities and we have raised up the chivalry and cooking and loyalty qualities. And it's only understandable that in an arc so focused around Sanji that he should be the one who makes a cake that is designed to stop Big Mom right in her tracks. One of my big predictions was that we would try to kill someone who had already eaten a devil fruit by cooking and feeding them a devil fruit, and that didn't happen. I feel like this is going to be one of the only times where food plays a really important role in the story and <laughs> it did not happen here. But also, we, we weren't going to poison the food. Sanji would be so heavily against this idea and we would go against everything that Sanji stood for that I feel like it would kind of downplay the arc. So I'm glad we didn't go for it, but I'm also glad Beige said it because, I mean, everyone was thinking it, right? Okay, something that I haven't talked about for the entirety of Whole Cake Island has been Jinbei and the Fishmen. These characters play a pretty big role in Whole Cake Island, and I just want to talk about Jinbei for a little bit. Jinbei is back in the crew, kind of. He's, he's fighting Big Mom still at the moment. Jinbei takes a hard stance as a competent negotiator. After the death of the respectable Emperor Whitebeard, Jinbei goes to Big Mom for help. I do wonder though, sorry to put any obligations on you, but like, Shanks? Shanks? It's kind of weird that you didn't take up the mantle on Fishman Island's protection. Like, I don't know. I feel like you would want to do that. It would be kind of weird if Fishman Island was just never brought up between Whitebeard and Shanks and he knew nothing about it. So that's weird. And it was only until Luffy declared beef with Big Mom that Jinbei again had to strategically figure out how to side with Luffy and keep Fishman Island safe. The fact that he would not die here because that's not what a crewmate of the Pirate King would do is, is beautiful. And hey, I like the variety. Luffy acts overly simplistic. Nami tries to patch out some of the flaws and Jinbei seems to be uh, patching the rough works that follow after. I want to end things off with Gold D. Roger. In Whole Cake Island, we learn that Roger is seemingly everywhere. He's been to Skypea and Fishman Island and now in Whole Cake Island? And not only did he manage to go to Whole Cake Island, but he also managed to get his hands on the Poneglyph. It makes sense, you need that to get to Laugh Tale, but it also implies that he took Kaido's Poneglyph too. Given the fact that Luffy just dipped out of Big Mom's train with Poneglyph notes in hand, I love the idea of history repeating. Luffy has gotten Big Mom's Poneglyph, and he's just about to dive into Kaido's Poneglyph. <laughs> I, wa I want to see it happen, because Big Mom's not out of the picture too. Like, Luffy just poked a bee nest, and now he's going to go poke another. <laughs> um, anyways, bam, that's it. Thanks to all my patrons who decided to crash some poor person's wedding. It was, it was not the right wedding. You did not get a power suit, and that family is forever traumatized. But hey, that wedding cake, though, that wedding cake was good.